I know you've got an ear out for the start of the podcast, but before we jump into today's episode, I wanted to remind you to keep an eye out for Daryl Lee's limited edition Christmas treats, because they're in stores now. Like the iconic Christmas nougat pudding, so yummy and a, and a gorgeous little gift. And some delicious Chrissy-themed twists on your favourite treats, like the Daryl Lee Rockley Road with chewy red and green jelly pieces, green and red crunchy milk chocolate balls, my favourites, and green apple and strawberry flavoured licorice. Watch them disappear. Your Christmas treats table will pop with colour and scrumptiousness. Spread some joy, bring the fun, and enjoy the Christmas tradition that is Daryl Lee. Hurry before they sell out. Daryl Lee makes Christmas better. This is The Five of My Life with me, Nigel Marsh. The series where I talk to notable people about five of their defining things. The way it works is my guests always choose a favourite film, book, song, place and possession. They tell me their choices in advance so I can research them, but they don't tell me why they've chosen them. That's the subject of our conversation. The reason I devised this series is I wanted to create a slightly different way to gain an insight into the real lives and thoughts of prominent people. Dr Gregory P. Smith is a lecturer at Southern Cross University. Homeless for much of his adult life, he famously spent 10 years living as a recluse in the rainforest outside of Mullumbimby on the northeast coast of New South Wales. A story detailed in his extraordinary memoir, Out of the Forest. Now, your book is, and I I don't say this lightly, one of the most moving, thought-provoking and inspiring stories I've ever read. Well, thank you. Um, that's humbling indeed, yes. Yeah, it, it had a had a rather powerful effect on me. And I've read a lot about you in the, in the process of researching for this. And one of the things that you uh, have said, I don't know if it's still true, is that you can't stand the sound of your own voice. <laughs> so I'm very... Is that true? It's still true. Yeah, well, listen, mate, this is going to go out on audio, so I can't, I can't do anything about that, but I do appreciate you uh, pushing through and forcing your voice on people. Uh, look, I, I just put it out there. I, I don't have to receive it. So. <laughs> well, well um, I, I gather that of the five uh, choices on Five My Life, the hardest one for you to settle on was the film, which is where we start on Five My Life, and you've chosen the 2016 Ben Affleck film The Accountant. I don't do a lot of films, so I, I'm not. And once again, you know, I'm not that um, well um, educated in film. Um, but I've watched The Accountant a couple of times. I really like Ben Affleck as, a, as an actor. I think um, he, he's very, very. He does his roles very well. But The Accountant, there's there's some dualities. Um, Within that role, you know, and it, it, um, it's a, it's a movie for me. It's a movie about autism, uh, being on the spectrum. Uh, it's about overcoming obstacles. Um, it's about what you can do, but it's also about uh, moral codes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, um, and I think sometimes, um, you know, we make judgment on people. Um, based on our own moral code um, uh, rather than their moral code. And, yeah, I mean, I don't agree with um, killing people or violence or things like that, but but it's the uh, the symbolism within that movie that I liked. And, and talk to me a little bit more about what the moral code is. What is the symbolism? Uh, well, the symbolism is, you know, um, is around taking, you know, just caring about people. Right, caring about people, and sometimes um, you know you see that that uh, other people just don't care about people. Um, I think one of the big the, the big things in the movie for me was his relationship um, with his brother. Right. Yeah, because um, his brother, uh, well, it was his younger brother, and uh, his brother. Um, Understood, I, I guess that autism at a at a, de- at a deeper level. So, yeah. And, and you know, you've got five sisters, is that correct, Gregory? I do. 
and uh, I mean, again, I've, I've watched the programs and listened to the uh, hopefully many of the interviews, and I'm sure not all of them that, that you've done. It, 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 how are relationships uh, across all of your siblings? Are you in touch with all of them? Or? <laughs> yeah, um, well, I'm in touch with three of them, um, two of them intermittently. Mm-hmm. Um, but I have a very good relationship with my siblings or the three of my siblings that I communicate with today. We, we meet once a year. Um, we, we rent a nice place out at Wulgorga and get up there and uh, just spend a week together and be kids. Um, you know, and it's a beautiful thing. Uh, and, and, and again, it, in some ways, um, they give me my space. They, are, they, they have a good understanding of who I am and they can give me my space mm. uh, and we can still have that time. But w- w- one of the things I uh, took from the film, um, uh, maybe bizarrely, was the how sort of appearances can be deceiving. So Ben Affleck's oh, yeah. an accountant, and but actually he's a sort of a Jason Bourne, <laughs> you, you know, gun-toting person. Yeah, it yeah. is one of the strangely most impactful things from reading your book, the, the edition that I've got, is the first two photographs. Because, uh, and the first one is your mum and dad in 1954 getting married, and the other one is you sitting with four of your sisters, not all of them. Um, because if you were to look at those pictures, especially of your mum and dad, you go, ah, oh. if you told me, I didn't know your story, oh, this, is, this is two people and it was, it's a Disney Hollywood romance story and they went on and were, were you know, happy as Larry yeah. forever. I'd go, yeah. well, they, they, they look beautiful in love and young and everything else, but obviously your story wasn't that. Um, do you think it was destined or was there anything that could have happened that could have stopped their lives playing out how they did? Oh, that's a that's that's a tough one. Um, I think it was destined. Mm-hmm. Um, look, I'm sure. Well, I have no doubt that when they were married, in that you know, when they were signing those papers mm. in that that photograph, they were very much in love. And I'm sure that their dreams were not, um, you know, to find themselves um, in violence, alcoholism. Um, and and uh, giving their kids away. Mm. Yeah, um, I'm sure. You know, no young couple getting married sort of dreams that that's going to be the outcome of their life. Unfortunately, that was the outcome of um, my of my parents' life. My father um, died of alcoholism. He he died of Korsakoff syndrome. Um, um, septicemia, blood poisoning. Um, and a few other things. My mum died uh, of fear. Right. Um, she uh, she had anxiety attacks and and, suff- and suffocated. Um, so that's not the way most people would dream their life to be when they're getting married. Um, I I love my dad today. Um, I love my mum today. You know and. Um, that, that, that's a, a wonderful, moving thing to hear you say that, having read that book and the events that, you know, the events that you went through. That's an amazing place for you to have come to. Well, again, uh, it, you know, I'll go back to the movie on this. Um, you know, it, it's, not, it's not about, it's about understanding people. You know, it's easy to judge people and it's easy for me to judge somebody based on, on, on the moral code that I have developed today, that would be easy, you know. But it, t- it's a lot more challenging for me to go and understand who they are, um, and I can only do that because I explored who I am. Right. Yeah. You know, um, and I, you know, I challenge anybody. Um, you know, if you want to, if you want to understand your mum, your dad, or any, you know, anybody, find out who you are first. Yeah. You know, if you know who you are, it changes your world. Can I ask you uh, to talk to your relationship with drink and your history with drink? I, I, I gave up booze 19 years ago and haven't had a drop oh, okay. since, but um, you go. Uh, I, I would be um, fascinated to hear your story. Yeah, sure. Um, well, as if you've read the book, you'll know that, um, you know, my the end of my journey with booze and alcohol or, and drugs 
uh, began with um, walking away from that park bench in a backpack that was on that park bench. Um, this is this is after ten years in the forest. This is after ten years in the forest. Yeah. Um, but my you know my journey with alcohol uh, began, I guess, at the age of about nineteen. Okay. Okay, and um, basically after I well. Actually, I can, I can pinpoint it down to the, to almost the exact day uh, because I was released from the institutions one week before my 19th birthday and it was the day that I was released that I went to the pub with their $2.25 and um, bought a couple of beers and the effect of those beers was very profound on me because I, I you know, after... Having this sense of angst and ang- well, this anguish and hatred and fear most of my life, and I had a couple of beers and I felt just really cool, really good, just for a moment. Um, and then I was to chase that feeling until, until I was forty-five. Right. Uh, and and that was about killing the pain, a bit, you know, because I, you know, that day. The pain was gone. That alcohol killed the pain for that day. And so I used drugs, alcohol, whatever, to try and kill that pain. Seems to me, al- alcohol never lets you down and always lets you down. It's, yep, yeah, yep. yeah. And, and this, the story that, uh, I mean, I, I find it it's just such a powerful read, but you getting into fights because in some way being beaten up was bizarrely known and comforting because that's what your sort of life was. Yeah. Could you talk to that? I mean, it just, just seems yeah. remarkable to someone who hasn't, didn't have your parental and orphanage and institutional and juvie experience. You go, I, I, you know, if, if I went to a pub and picked the fight with the biggest, scariest bloke so I could get beaten, I mean, I just can't imagine that. Yeah. yeah I've got a few scars. Um, <laughs> the, it, we 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 know about um, people that self mutilate. You know, they cut themselves with razor blades, bash their head on the wall. You know, and I mean, what I was doing is basically the same thing, just right. in a different form. Um, and I'd go in, and I'd because there'd be that much emotional pain uh, within me that I'd, you know, I'd be I'd be seeking escape from that emotional pain. And uh, one way of doing that was to go on and override that, that emotional pain with physical pain. Right. So I would go in, I'd pick a fight, and if there wasn't a, a guy in there big enough, I'd pick a fight with a few of them. Um, and, um, yeah, that would satisfy me for a, for a period of time. Sorry to interrupt you, Gregory, but you wouldn't want necessarily to win the fight. You want to be beaten up. Oh, absolutely. No, it wasn't about winning a fight. So, so, so you're lucky they didn't kill you. I mean, on one of these occasions. I mean, uh, a couple of occasions they could have. Um, yeah. Um, I, I look. I, I, I feel that I'm very fortunate to be alive today. Yeah. You know, and, I, and I do not take that for granted. I really, genuinely do not take my life for granted today. And um, any life, I yeah. don't. Yeah. You know, life is an, an amazing thing. Um, consciousness is an amazing thing. So, and, and on that, when you walked away from that park bench, did you you just went cold turkey? You went that's it, and not another drop touched your lips, or did you relapse, or did you do it slowly, or did you just say that's it, I'm done? Uh, I'm done. I yeah. walked away. Uh, um, I gave up uh, cigarettes, alcohol, marijuana, um, amphetamines, all on the same, and cocaine. All the same time. And what was the date? Do you know the date? N- um, no, I don't know the date of that one. That's <laughs> the, it should, pretty. It should sick. be a national <laughs> holiday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I know. It was uh, I know it was in April sometime? April right. two th- April two thousand. Okay. So um, April the fifth, two thousand and three, for me. But gosh, <laughs> good, good on you, mate. I'm going to change the tone because that, that's you know quite heavy topics, and and your your film was a you know an action thriller, and we're going to go to one of the very best books I think ever written 
Uh, and, and hilarious how it's described, a trilogy in five parts. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Douglas Adams, 1979, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. T- tell me why you've chosen that and your story behind that, Gregory. Um, well, uh, the instruction was to choose a book. Um, if I had a choice, I would have chosen the, the trilogy, the five books. <laughs> um, they are just an amazing, um, thought-provoking um yeah, you know, I, I, the first time I encountered uh, Douglas Adams was while I was living in the forest. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, I picked up this book, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I'd never heard of Douglas Adams. It was at, the, at a um, St. Vincent's op shop, and uh, I'd gone in to buy some rags to put over my home brew, and um, I saw a hitchhiker. And it was the word hitchhiker that got me because I'd spent most of my <laughs> life hitchhiking. You thought it was a real guy. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, like, this is great, you know. So I, I grabbed it um, and I took it up. And I'm not, at that time, I, you know, I struggled to read. Um, and, you know, when you're coming across words like slutty blood fart, <laughs> um, you know, I'm trying to work out how do you pronounce that, you know. And, I, and it beca- to read the book became a challenge. And I found myself walking around the forest, you know, with peacocks and all this, all manner of um, life, laughing my head off, at, <laughs> you know, because I'm thinking about, you know, I'm, I might have only read half a page in two days, you know, but I consumed it. It was, it was just a, a beautiful, intelligent, mind-fertilizing Read, and I mean, you know, and, and I mean, just stepping out of the Hitchhiker's Guide for the Galaxy, one of the other books I didn't, don't recall which one it was exactly that really got me was ha- to learn how to fly, to teach a human how to fly. You know, right. it was like, you know, um, it's so simple. Why didn't I ever think of that? You know, you throw yourself at the ground and miss. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just that, that image, I, I'm so grateful for you sharing that story because because uh, you know, having read the book and, and and listened to your interviews and watched your tv interviews you go, uh, the, the fact that there was you know some brief humor and happiness i mean, I, mean I, I, I remember as a as a young boy reading that book and laughing yeah and so there are you in the forest trying to find the answer to the universe well mate it's 42 it's 42 <laughs> <laughs> that's the answer stop your searching it's, it's like it's a um uh, yeah uh what an amazing read. And, you know, it gave me a lot of comfort and it has continued to give me comfort over the years. I do, you know, I'll be going on a drive somewhere, you know, and all of a sudden it'll jump into my mind and it's all the, this drive just becomes a whole pleasant experience. That's wonderful. It's, it's, it's an incredible read. One of the things that, that good comedians and humorists do is they, they are able to look at things with a different perspective. Yeah. And you and I, on a previous conversation, were talking about the sociological imagination, mm. the, which is the ability, yeah. and, and you've now learned PhD, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Could you talk to us about what the sociological imagination is? Yeah, sure. Um, it's, it's a concept developed by C. Mills. Um, and basically... Um, very simple. It's just understanding something or seeing something, seeing a, uh, from a different perspective, and that, or, or several different perspectives. And those perspectives are cultural, uh, historical, and and structural. So you know, if I'm thinking, and this is, you know, this is this perspective really, really helped me to understand my life. Uh, understand my mother, my father, my family, because when I started to um, learn, you know, apply sociological principles and that sociological perspective into my life, and I was able to reflect uh, and try to understand my mother and father, what I needed to do is have a look at this, you know, uh, the history, uh, the, the the culture, the structure of the time. So. You know what? What was the you know what was the um, 
the norms of that era. And, you know, kids were seen and not heard. So, and kids were the possessions of their parents. You know, kids didn't have rights in those days. Um, understanding that, um, and that was the same for my father. You know, my father was a possession of his father and my mother was a possession of her mother. Um, and the trauma that can be caused if a, if, a, if a young person is treated inappropriately in those circumstances. The other part is um, understanding that the authorities had no, had no power to act or to, you know, to remove children in those days. You know, it wasn't until 1994, I think it was, um, that Australia actually put, the, put a signature to the United Nations um, uh, Rights of the Child. Right. So, um, you know, we tend to um, move on in our in our history very quickly, and you know, we we put these things aside, and we 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 forget, or we overlook the context of all these things. But when we start to look at that sociological perspective, um, we can start to put it into place. And one of the tragic, tragic things is if you actually do take a child away from a, a, an unhealthy, violent um, parental situation like you had, uh, there's no guarantee that the place that you're going to put them is any better. And the systemic uh, institutional abuse, uh, I mean, if you, if you don't mind, and please don't talk about anything you don't want to talk about, but the, oh my goodness, the St. Patrick's Orphanage story, um, uh, you know, that was supposed to be caring for you and it i mean would you mind telling us a little bit about st patrick's yeah um again uh this may sound strange um but the nuns were doing the best they could you know they were doing what they believed in uh, of course in my world um it's abusive um the, and yeah, you know, and again, if I you know, use my sociological imagination, go back to that era. Yeah, uh, we we had um, gender gender separation. You know, boys and girls were separated. That was what happened, for whatever reason. Um, and as my mother sort of surrendered us to the orphanage, and we walked up those stairs, and I went to the left, and my sisters went to the right. That was that was the time. Mm -hmm. um, of course, nobody explained that to me. All I saw was my sisters, the only people that I really knew and trusted and cared about, going down that way, and I was afraid. I was, I was afraid. I was afraid for them, and I was afraid for me. And I, um, even at that young age, um, you know, I, I had a voice, and I, and I spoke my mind, which got me into a lot of trouble. I might add. And, and, and that and trouble is beatings and being locked in a cupboard under the stairs and yeah 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 I would I was often locked in that cupboard and I would often run away um, and I'd be picked up by the authorities by the police and then I'd cop a hiding from the police because you know I was giving the nice nuns a hard time and you know not respecting the nuns they'd take me back to the orphanage and hand me over to the nuns and I'd cop another hiding and a beating and I'd be locked in the, under the stairway there for uh, for a day or two, sometimes only a few hours, but, yeah, it just depends. But, I mean, that was a story that went on. Um, you know, even in the reform centres and things like that, I, you know, I would get into quite a bit of trouble. I'd find myself in isolation in the concrete cells quite often um, because I had a voice. Yeah. It, it, it's it's remarkable you have such a generous forgiving gentle kind narrative about those about those events it's a it's a lesson well to us all but to me in particular i just think it's incredible that you talk about it so so gently if that's the right word well nigel is it um if i didn't know it i'd only be punishing my, myself yeah yeah um i i I don't want to allow these places, these people, space in my world today. Yes. You know, if I'm going to talk about them and I need, you know, it's important to talk about them. I don't need to, but um, it's important to. I did need to talk about them when I was writing the book. 
Yes. I think, you know, we need to talk about things until we come to terms with, understand and can um, park things or forgive things, yeah? And I needed to do that. But today, they don't, they don't take space in my mind uh, because I've dealt with it. I can talk with it, talk about them, uh, and I can talk about them briefly, put them aside, and then they don't worry me for the rest of the day. Which is the perfect link to your third choice. We're coming on to your song. And on Five of My Life, we've had now uh, two artists that have been chosen the most. There's the Beatles, which has been chosen three times, and Bob Dylan, who you have chosen three, and and that's been chosen three times. And you've chosen a song that's already on the Five of My Life uh, Spotify playlist. It's like a rolling stone. And I can imagine, I I I can... assume I know part of the reason why you've chosen it, but please tell us about um, your song choice on Five of My Life, Gregory. Yeah, sure. Uh, look, this is, a, you know, my, my interpretation of this song is about security. Uh, it's about lived security, and it's something that I never had. I never had lived security. Today I do. Um, but, you yeah, know, when I sit down and I and I reflect on the song, um, you know, and there's other there's other metaphors that fit into this as well. You know, the Rolling Stone gathers no moss and things like this. But um, yeah, and and it's about foundations for me. It's just about look, Bob Dylan, Bob Dylan is a is a uh, well is an amazing ballad storyteller. Um, yeah, I mean, the depth of thought that goes into some of these ballads um, is incredible and just thought-provoking. And, um, yeah, it's just one of those songs that uh, I, I put up there, strangely enough, with um, Queen, Freddie Mercury, right. uh, Bohemian Rhapsody. You know, it's like, um, yeah, it challenges my thinking. And, and I, I'm delighted to say that you now do have some stability. Would you tell us uh, what your current sort of state of mind, your current state is, uh, you know, where you're living, who you're living with, and, and what are you doing? Oh, well, um, yeah, sure. Um, well, look, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a, what can I say, I'm a very, very fortunate man. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm a very privileged uh, person in a very privileged position. Uh, I work I'm a I'm a lecturer at a university. I'm a social researcher. Um, look, I've just won or well, just signed some contracts with a with the government for uh, a whole lot of research or evaluation of their research. Um, very privileged. I, I I still have my little piece of forest. Um, I you know I live in the forest still. I've I've got a little tin shed there that I call home. It's nothing spectacular. But it's mine. And, and, and did you share it with any any other human or animal, or is it on your Todd? Uh, look, I share my space with a whole lot of critters, <laughs> um, and that's why I like it. Look, my, my place is, I call my place Three Lizards. Right. Okay, uh, because there's, well, I don't know why the three, to be honest. It just sounded good to me. But there's lots of lizards. I like the snakes, um, lots of tree snakes, lots of, you know, there's, I've got four different species of um um, of um, kangaroo or wallaby, yeah. So uh, from the from the big grey down to the little uh, blue flyer. Um, so uh, different, several different species of monitor and goanna, goanna, skinks. Oh, look, it's a beautiful place. Birds, birds. You know, the only difference today is I own it. Right. Yeah. You know, um, you know, I have this, I own this, you know, 20 acres of forest that I can live in and call home. Um, and that's security, you know. Um, nobody can take that away from me. But coming on to your fourth choice, uh, and I'm, I'm slightly worried I'm going to mispronounce this, uh, your place that you've chosen, Gregory, on Five of My Life is Lan Itza. Lan Itza. Which is a locality south of Grafton in northern New South Wales. Is that correct? It, that is correct, yes. Could, could you describe it and tell us the story behind it? Well, I think I already have, Nigel. <laughs> <laughs> that's just the property we're talking about? That is the property. Okay, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's where I live, at, at Lan Itza. Uh, I just love, I love the way it rolls off my tongue, Lan Itza. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, on... Now, um, you know, to the south you'll have Glen Ray, Nana Glen. I think uh, Russell Crowe lives at Nana, or he 
his mother lives at Nana Glen or something. And then you've got, you know, um, Coffs Harbour and that. And then to the north, you've got, um, you know, Coots Crossing, Grafton. But right in the centre, you have Lanitza. <laughs> and, and and this is not near the the rainforest that you lived in for ten years. This is this is no. considerably south, isn't it? It is. It is considerably south. Yes. And and, yeah, and there's a reason for that. Um, that the, that there's chapters in my life, and that chapter from that rainforest is is closed. Yes. You know, it was, it's a great chapter. I learned a lot. I bring the lessons with me. I journey with that each day. Um, but there's new there's new journeys to be had as well. You know, I think, you know, one of the exciting things I've learned in my life is that um, new things keep me young. Exploring life keeps me young at, at heart, young at mind. Hmm. Um, you know, I don't like the idea of just getting tied down to, um, to the same, same old. Like I have routine, I have discipline, um, I have security, but I like to explore. I like to be adventurous. Wonderful. We're coming on to your last choice, which is often my favourite, uh, people's possession. Uh, and you have chosen, and, and uh, I hope I have got this correct, Gregory, it's a gold bear ring. Could you describe it? Yeah. Uh, look, it's just a really simple nine-carat gold pinky ring. Yeah, and I bought it in 2003. And I actually I bought it off uh, off eBay um, because uh, I had been thinking some time about my childhood and how do I come to terms with that? How do I sort of br- build the bridge from from child into where I was at the time? And I never had toys per se um, you know I uh, and I never had a, a, a bear or any cuddly toys or anything like that um, but what I realized was that inside of me there's also there's a child as well yeah and you know every now and then I realized that this child wanted attention and it came out in various ways like you know, just really silly things, really childish things. Uh, and I, my logic wasn't able to understand what was going on. You know, why do I suddenly say this or act like this or feel like this? And then I realised that there was a child inside of me. You know, and, um, and I'd never really acknowledged that there was a child inside of me. And so I started to explore that. And un- try to understand that, and um, as best I could, introduce myself to my child inside. Right. And and I actually got to like this child that was inside. I thought you you're a cheeky little fellow, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. So I decided I was going to get him a gift, and um, I went and I decided I was going to go and get this child a gift, and. Um, I had taken on this great new adventure of the internet. Um, and there's a funny story there, but probably not time to No, no, tell it. Please tell it. Well, I was going to, I just started university as well. And um, there was this sign up on one of the notice boards. Um, Would you like to learn to surf? <laughs> but <laughs> be here at 10 o'clock. And, of course, I was just introduced to the internet and surfing the net and all this sort of stuff. So I rock up to this point in you know, at the university uh, with my book and everything ready to go, and I'm standing there and everybody turns up with their surfboards <laughs> and, their, and it was the wrong sort of surfing. <laughs> but um, anyway, I, I did some surfing on the net and uh, found this little gold uh, bear ring and I purchased that for the child within. Oh, that's just a beautiful story. That's a, I, I've loved hearing you talk about your, your five choices. I'm, I'm going to ask you just a couple more questions, uh, Gregory. And, and, and one is you, you've said uh, that you've constructed a man that you like, that you now are, and, and you, 
you want good friends and to be a good friend and you want to help vulnerable people in our society. So just two questions. It is one, what is the, the quality you most value and admire in other people? And, and the second question is, what do you think we, the one thing that we could do as a society to help those vulnerable people better? In response to your first question, and I'll go back to a, a very simple, well, my you know, a sociological um, principle here. You know, as, as humans, one of the things that makes us so different is that we tell stories. We talk to each other. Yeah. One of the great things that I, I, I respect in another human being is their ability to sit and listen to another human being's story and, and to try and understand what that story is about. I think if we could do that a lot more, then we will be able to help the more vulnerable more often. Yeah, so, so listening is an act of love, someone once said listening, to me. Listening is an act of love, not just love, but well, it is love, but it's, and love is understanding, mm. it's caring. Um, you know, sometimes we try to be good, but in those, that act of trying to be good, we actually do more damage. And sometimes it's just, we just need to listen. Well, it's, it's been just a privilege listening to you today. I can't thank you enough. And I'm going to come to the, the six trick question, six which trick is, question. <laughs> <laughs> get yourself ready, mate. Uh, okay. Who would you like to hear on Five of My Life next? Oh, that's a big question, isn't it? Um, who would I like to hear on Five of My Life? You've caught me off guard there. Well, there's, um, okay. Uh, I, my, the first person that jumps into my mind is Gillian Triggs. Right. And, and why would you like to hear from Gillian? She's an amazing human being. Um, she has done a lot of work for human, humanity in this country. Mm -hmm. um, her, her, um, I was privileged, very privileged to have, uh, you know, uh, share some time with Gillian while she was having luncheon uh, at one, or dinner at one time before she spoke to a human rights conference um, for Nagara. Um, I was very taken by her kindness, her friendship. Um, another person would be, of course, Richard Feidler. Ah, okay. Gillian and Richard Feidler. Um, we'll put those in our uh, book. We're going to get round to all the people that people have suggested and ask them on. We can't guarantee that they'll say yes, but <laughs> it has been so wonderful that you did say yes. And I, I, I just wish you so much love and happiness in many, many, many years ahead. So thank you so much, Gregory. Nigel, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting with you. The Five of My Life was presented by me, Nigel Marsh. Producer, Alex Mitchell. Sound production and theme music by Darcy Thompson and Matt Nicholish. Listener.